Well, good evening to you all, my Victory Through Faith Church family and friends. It's me, Pastor Jay. I speak and I decree the blessing of the Lord over your lives. I pray that all is going well with you. And it's my prayer that all will go well for you. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 28, that God makes all things work together for good for those who love him and for those who are called according to his purpose. So that's why I believe that we can have a confident expectation of good. As long as we love him, he'll make whatever's going on in our lives to be turned around for our good. What does that mean, Pastor Jay? That doesn't mean that everything that happens in our lives, God caused it. That means that whatever occurs in our lives, if we love God and we obey his word, then he'll take that thing and shape it and cause it to work together for our good. So I believe that God's doing that for you. And I want you to connect your faith with mine so that you can receive the manifestation of what we're standing for. Amen. Well, I've got a great word for you today. We're going to continue with lesson three of our series, Flesh Dead, Spirit Led. Flesh Dead, Spirit Led. And I've been thoroughly enjoying prepping this series. I've thoroughly enjoyed teaching this series. And I pray that you are enjoying receiving the revelation that comes from what we are covering in this series. It's been a blessing to my life. It's been a blessing for me to be able to share it with you. And I pray that it continues to be a blessing for you as you grow into the victory that God has secured for you through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's go for the Lord in prayer and then we'll get started with today's lesson. Father God, as always, I thank you for your spirit who leads and guides us into all truth. I thank you that as your word goes forth, it goes forward with accuracy and with simplicity. I declare that the teaching and the preaching of your word empowers your people through faith and it equips your people for service. So, Father God, we just submit ourselves to you right now to receive wisdom and revelation knowledge as your word is taught. I pray that the word is sown in our hearts and we bear the fruit of faith. We bear the fruit of trust. We bear the fruit of patience. We bear the fruit of endurance so that we may receive what you have promised to us in the scriptures. I thank you for it now, Father God, and I surrender and submit my entire self to you as a vessel to be used for your glory in Jesus name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, let's get ready to get into this thing. As I alluded, I've been enjoying, as I alluded to before, I have thoroughly enjoyed teaching around this series. And we started out with this introductory statement that if you truly want to live for God and impact the world around you, you, us, we, we must choose to allow God's spirit to lead us and refuse to let our flesh rule us. That means we got to make a choice. I refuse to let my flesh rule me and I choose to allow my spirit guided and directed by the Holy Spirit to guide me. Amen. Praise the Lord. And our lesson text, uh, I read several last week and, and the week before. I'm just going to read Galatians chapter five verses 16 through 18 right now, because I'm going to come back to that at a later point. Galatians chapter five, I'll be reading from the King James version of the Bible today. It says this, verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust, the passion, the desires of the flesh. Verse 17 says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Verse 18 says, but if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, last week we dealt primarily with the conflict between and we learned that it was a consistent conflict. It's a continual conflict every day. There's conflict between our flesh and our spirits. And we learn that that conflict between our flesh and our spirit exists. 
We saw that conflict played out in Romans chapter seven. Paul talks about the thing that I want to do, I don't do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I, I end up doing. And so we looked at the conflict between what our reborn human spirits desires to do versus what our unregenerated, unrenewed flesh is pulled towards. And that conflict exists every day and that conflict exists for every child of God. So don't think that because you feel a pull in certain areas or you feel a pull in certain directions that you've backslidden or you're not a born again child of God. No, you're a child of God. If you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God, if you believe that he died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that he rose from the dead for your sanctification, your redemption, your salvation, if you believe that he's seated at the right hand of the father, then you are a child of God. If you've made that declaration of faith and you can still have a pull toward the things that don't please God because you still have that flesh that wants what it wants, that runs contrary to what your reborn human spirit, that new man, that new creation in Christ Jesus, what that new man desires to do, where that new man desires to go and what that new man desires to have. So today I wanna drive home the truth that no matter how good of a person you may think you are, your flesh cannot be trusted i don't care how good you think you are hey I, i'm a good listener I, I like helping people you know whenever i got an opportunity to do good i'm gonna do good hey that's great and you still can't trust yourself you still cannot trust your flesh i'm gonna show you plainly why you can't do it we learned about the conflict next last week today we're going to learn why the flesh can't be trusted. So let me open up with this and we'll we'll launch from this perspective. The flesh, your flesh, my flesh, our flesh cannot be bargained with, trusted or tolerated. I say that again. Your flesh, my flesh, no Christian's flesh, no born again child of God's flesh can be bargained with trust it or tolerate it. That's only one thing you can do with it. It must be put to death. It must be put to death. Flesh dead, spirit led. Let's look at some scriptures to back that up. Galatians chapter two and verse 20, Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So he said, even though I've died, I'm alive. I, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So obviously there's a part of him that dies and there's a part of him that is alive. His flesh is dying and his spirit is alive. And that's the same way you and I have to be. We got to die to our flesh and we have to live according to our reborn human spirits being led and guided by Holy Spirit. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me and the life which check this out and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live that life in the flesh by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's such a powerful scripture. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. He died. I die. Yet nevertheless, I live because he lives. I live. He said, but Christ lives in me and the life that I now live in the flesh, in my body. I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, I die to my flesh every day. I crucify my flesh. What does crucify mean? That means I put it to death. I crucify my flesh. Let's look at Galatians chapter five, verse 24. We read it last week. I wanted to read it again to drive home this truth that you can't bargain with your flesh. You cannot trust your flesh. You can't even tolerate your flesh. It has to be put to death. Galatians chapter five, verse 24. I was in Ephesians. Let me get over to Galatians. It says, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Affections means 
passions, desires, and lust just means strong desires typically that are not in line with God's will for our lives. So we got to crucify the flesh and though, and if we're in Christ, that flesh has to be crucified with its affections, with its passions, with its lust, with the things that don't want to submit to the will of God. So that leads me to this question. Pastor Jay, we keep talking about the flesh. Okay, my flesh can't be trusted. I'm still unclear. You know, we even looked at Romans 7 last week, Pastor Jay, and I saw that in my flesh was no good thing. We'll look at that a little later. But I just don't get it. What's my flesh you mean? I can't trust my body when my body is part of me. Didn't God make my body? Well, yes, God made your body. God made bodies. He made Adam. He made Eve. He shaped. He formed. He, he created Adam from the dust of the ground. And then, and then he blew into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. So how, you might say, well, how can anything that God made be bad? Or how can anything that God made not be able to be trusted? Because the thing that God made fell victim to sin when man disobeyed, when Adam disobeyed in the garden. So the thing, the perfect thing that God made became corrupted. And even though we've received salvation and redemption through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that means we are spiritually right with God. Our flesh is still contaminated, still hampered by the effects of sin. And because of that, it still wants the things that are not in line with God's will. That's what we typically refer to when we're talking about the flesh. It's the nature of man that pulls away from God. When we talk about the flesh, especially in the context that we're teaching from, the flesh represents the desires of human nature that are not subject to God. There are some things that humans desire to do that are not subject to God, that are not in line with God's will. There are things that people do every day that are uh, against or contrary to God's will for humanity. And it doesn't matter how many people embrace it as acceptable. In God's sight, it's still sin. In God's sight, it's still wrong. In God's sight, it's still contrary to his design and his plan for mankind. And the reason that so many people engage and indulge in it is because the flesh is not restricted. The flesh is being bargained with. The flesh is being tolerated instead of being put to death. And we make excuses for the flesh so we can continue to operate in it. And that's not the way a born again child of God should function. Anything that goes against the will of God and we do it is a work of the flesh. It's the flesh acting out and rising against what our spirit man desires to do. So we said that flesh represents the desire. Let's look at Romans chapter eight. Flesh represents the desires of human nature that are not subject to God. In Romans chapter 8, I start at verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So you can only be after, or you can only be pursuing one thing at a time. Either I'm pursuing the spirit or I'm pursuing the flesh. If I'm pursuing the flesh, I'm going to follow the things of the flesh. If I'm pursuing the spirit, I'm going to follow the things of the spirit. I'm going to follow the desires of the spirit. If I pursue the flesh, I'm going to follow the desires of the flesh. That's what it means when it says they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Verse six says for to be carnally minded a fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And often in scripture, when the Bible speaks of death, especially in the New Testament, yes, it does mean physical death. However, more often it refers to the spiritual death or the separation from God that we experience when we rebel against his will for our lives. So if you curse right, if you curse right now and the Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So we know if we swear, if we if we say the Lord's name in vain or if you lie, 
Are you going to physically drop dead and die? No. But your conscience will know that you violated the will of God and that will cause some type of separation to take place. Maybe you'll struggle in your prayers. Maybe you'll struggle reading your scripture because you feel like you're a hypocrite. Maybe you'll struggle in sharing the gospel with somebody because you know your own internal private struggles. And so there's a there's a death that takes place. There's a separation from confidence in God that takes place when we continue to indulge the flesh. That's what we're talking about here. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is, or I, I will say this, to be spiritually minded produces life and peace. Being carnally minded produces death. Verse seven says, for the carnal mind or the mind of the flesh is enmity or hostile against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. <sighs> Listen to this. The carnal mind, the mind of the flesh, the desires of the flesh is enmity or hostile against God. Why? For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The flesh, human nature, cannot be subject to God. It runs in direct opposition to the things of God. That's why you can't bargain with it. That's why you can't trust it. That's why you cannot tolerate it. You must put your flesh to death. Your flesh indicates your human nature apart from any divine influence, apart from the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And if, and if sin operates through the flesh, then you can't trust your flesh, can you? Now your spirit man is flawless. I've shared multiple times that your spirit man, when you give your life to Christ Jesus, you instantly become a born again child of God. And the Holy Spirit moves upon your spirit, sealing it until the day of redemption. In other words, he preserves and protects your spirit man. However, you still got flesh to deal with and you still have a mind that needs to be renewed. So if I don't renew my mind and if I don't crucify my flesh, I can be a flawless, spiritual, born again, child of God and still be operating out of the flesh because I'm not putting it to death. I'm tolerating it. I'm bargaining with it. I'm trusting it. And it's causing my spirit man to diminish and dwindle and become anemic. That's good, Holy Spirit. If you don't feed your spirit, man, your spirit man will become anemic. And if your spirit man is anemic, your flesh will be all too happy to take over. We'll be all too happy because we feed our flesh all the time. When you watch TV, primarily you're feeding your flesh. When you listen to certain music, you're feeding your flesh. When you're on social media, you're feeding your flesh. Unless it's something that's spiritually beneficial and spiritually uplifting, we feed our flesh way more than we feed our spirits. And so it's easy for your flesh to take over because it's getting the most attention. So we have to crucify our flesh. We got to die to our flesh and we have to feed our spirits and follow after the Holy Spirit so that our spirit can tell our flesh we don't trust you and we're not going in that direction. Listen to this. The flesh, the human nature opposed to the things of God. The flesh cannot be trusted or tolerated because it rebels against God and his influence over our lives. That's good. That's good. So first we learn that we can't trust and we can't bargain with and we can't tolerate the flesh. Now we see why we can't bargain with it, why we can't trust it, why we can't tolerate it, because the flesh rebels against God and his influence over over our lives. Your flesh don't want you to submit to God. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee. Your flesh don't want you to submit to God because if you submit to God, then that means you're going to crucify your flesh. You're going to tell your flesh, you can't have that. You can't do that. You can't go there. You can't say that. And your flesh doesn't like to be restricted. Your flesh does not like to be told what to do. Because your flesh operates in selfishness and pride. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Your flesh is engaged and your flesh is ignited by lust and pride. And your flesh doesn't want to be told what it can't have. And your flesh doesn't want to be told what it can't do. 
That's why you got to crucify the flesh. You got to put it to death. I say this for my own personal understanding. I have to crucify my flesh and certify my spirit every single day. I got to I got to stamp the one who's supposed to be calling the shots. My spirit led by Holy Spirit should be calling the shots because I'm getting instruction from Holy Spirit every day. This is how I want you to move. This is how I want you to pray. This is how I want you to study. This is how I want you to read. This is where I want you to go. I don't want you to say that. I want you to say this. I don't want you to send that text. I want you to wait. I want you to call them instead of emailing them. Every aspect of your life should be under the authority of the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, our helper, the paraclete, our comforter, our counselor, our helper, our intercessor, our strengthener, our standby. We should submit to his ministry of help so we don't have to depend on our flesh when we don't know what to do. We go to the Spirit of God. The flesh cannot be trusted or tolerated because by nature it rebels against God and his influence in and over our lives. Look, the Bible tells us, I'm going to show you in three places real quick. The Bible gives us plain, clear evidence that you can't trust your flesh. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Look at what it says. Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Now, that's enough for me. If Paul said it, and he wrote two thirds of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If Paul says in Romans 7, 18, for I know that in me and he clarifies it, he says that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. Then I know that my flesh can't be trusted because there's nothing good in it. There's nothing good in my flesh. And if there ain't nothing good in it, I won't bargain with it. I won't tolerate it. I won't trust it. Romans chapter eight. We're already right there. Let's look at verse eight. Romans eight, eight says, so they that are in the flesh. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Uh, in my margin in this Bible says those who are in the flesh, those who are controlled by the flesh can't please God. Well, if I can't please God in my flesh, I'm not going to operate out of my flesh. You can't please God in the flesh, the flesh has no capability of pleasing God. It is, it is not possible for flesh to please God because flesh is counterintuitive to the things of God. It does not want to yield to God in no way, shape, form, or fashion. Remember, it only wants what it wants, it, its desires, its lust, the sinful nature that has not been regenerated yet. We, your flesh won't be dealt with until Christ comes back and we get our glorified bodies. Because remember, the sin principle, the issue, flesh animates itself through our bodies. If you lie, you lie with your what? Your mouth. If you struck a person or you hit a person maliciously, you hit that person with your what? Your hands. Everything we do is typically with our bodies. And so our flesh uses our bodies to propel its desires or to fulfill its desires. Whatever it wants to do, it has to use our bodies. If you're a man and you lay with another woman, you got to use your body to do that. If you're a woman and you lay with another man and, you're, and you're married, you got to use your body to do that. If you're a man or you're a woman and you have sex outside of marriage, you got to use your body to do that. And God's not pleased with any aspect of it. The only sexual Encounters that pleases God are the encounters between a man and a woman that have been joined in the union of marriage. Everything else is not pleasing to God. Now, I know we live in a culture that feels differently. I'm not here to have arguments about it. That's not my assignment. That's not my calling. However, the scriptures are very plain that God ordains sexual relations between a man and a woman only when they are joined in the union of holy matrimony. Everything else is a work of the flesh. Mm. Jesus. Now that ain't to condemn. That ain't to make nobody feel bad. That's for you to know the truth. And when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Amen. Hallelujah. When you're led by the spirit, it'll lead you out of situations. Hallelujah. He will lead you out of things that you shouldn't be in. He will lead you away from situations and, and, and circumstances that would 
tempt you and cause you to do something you want you don't want to do he'll lead you away from those situations and circumstances if you trust him yeah there's nothing good in your flesh <laughs> romans 8 8 <laughs> So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God in your flesh. Even in chap in John chapter 6. We'll go there real quick. John chapter 6. We always typically go to John 6 and we read one particular version of it. Um, <laughs> John 6, 63 says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. Praise the Lord. And then we typically read that the spirit, though I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that Jesus speaks are spirit and they are life. Amen. But we miss a key right here. It says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. There is no profit in the flesh at all. Living, moving, operating in and according to the flesh will not profit you, will not profit us at all. So we know there's nothing good in our flesh. We know that the flesh doesn't profit us anything. We know that the flesh cannot please God. So what's left? Well, what's left? You got to make a choice. It's our responsibility not to give the flesh any opportunity to rebel. You can't give your flesh an opportunity to rebel. Don't give your flesh an opportunity for, okay. Don't give your flesh an opportunity for it to exercise its lust. You got you got some stuff you just got to get away from. Some things you just got to flee from. I think many believers fall into a trap because we're sitting here trying to bargain with something that we should be fleeing and running from. Joseph didn't try to bargain with Potiphar's wife. He ran. The Bible says flee temptation. He got up out of there. As I like to say, my, my folks back in the day, you say he caught some hat. He got up out of there. Stop trying to bargain with situations you just need to remove yourself from. No, they're not going to ever give in the way you want them to give in because you're not supposed to be there. Flee temptation. Don't bargain with it. Get away from it. Put some distance between you and the thing that's tempting you. It's our responsibility not to give the flesh any opportunity to rebel. In Romans chapter 13, verse 14, says it very clearly. Mm. We give the flesh too much, too, too much, too much rope. We give the flesh too many opportunities to separate us from Staying united with God. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. However, it's our choices that we make that introduce separation because the more choices we make that are against the will of God, the more our conscience starts to tell us, hey, you shouldn't have did that. That's, you know, you're out of order and we find it difficult to stay connected to God. Romans 13 verse 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust or evil desires thereof. In other words, don't make no room for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. You know how you got company coming over, you clean up the house and if they're gonna stay for a while, you'll make sure that they got fresh towels and fresh rags and you'll make sure that the room they're gonna stay in is clean and, 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 and kept and ready and prepared for the people that are coming over. Well, in the same way, stop preparing for your flesh. Stop making provision for your flesh. You know that if you go down that road, what it's going to lead to. Why are you allowing yourself to make provision to go down the road? Just don't go. Well, I can handle it. I can handle it. No. You know how many people have fallen because they thought they could handle something? And what do I mean by falling? I mean falling from a place where they were flowing with God on a level where he could communicate with them. They could receive it and they could obey what he said and see the hand of God move in the earth. They falling from that place because they thought, well, I can handle this. And they went into situations that they found out and they didn't find out until it was too late. I can't handle it. But by the time they were reaching out for help, the enemy had already sprung the trap. Don't make provision for your flesh and don't give the devil an opportunity. That's what, <laughs> yeah, sometimes, not sometimes, when we disobey God, all we're doing is giving the devil an opportunity. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, I start at verse 22. 
and then we'll stop here. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation or the former manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. That's a reference to our flesh, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, if your mind is renewed, you won't keep going in the direction you've been going in and that you put on the new man. Hallelujah. Which is which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying or putting away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Did you know that when you operate from an angry place, all you're doing is giving the enemy a foothold? It says don't give place to the devil. We often give a place to the devil by operating in disobedience to the word of God, by allowing anger to fester. Yeah, the, when, when, because when you're angry, you say things you wouldn't normally or naturally say. Anger suspends logic. So the angrier I get, the less logical I become. And I say things and do things I never thought I would have said or done. That's why it says, be ye angry, because I know y'all can be angry. Angry is a natural emotion, but don't sin when you're angry. Don't react, respond. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. The longer you hold on to anger, the bigger the foothold you create for the enemy. That's why it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Even if you can't get it right with the person you're angry with, at least release it from yourself. I'm not carrying this into the morning. I really, I, I hadn't even talked to them. I'll talk to them later, but I'm not going to carry it into the next day. Because the longer you hold on to it, the bigger the foothold you give to the enemy. It's our responsibility not to give the flesh any opportunity to rebel. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't give the devil any opportunity. The only way, and we'll get ready to close here. The only way to overcome and override the flesh is by submitting to the leading of the Holy Spirit in every area of our lives. Spirit, soul, body, socially, financially. That's the only way. If your spending is out of control, you got to die to your flesh. You got to die to those desires that are causing you to spend more than you should be spending. And you got to ask the Holy Spirit to lead you in your spending. You didn't know you could do that. The Holy Spirit is concerned about everything that concerns you. And so you can ask the Holy Spirit to give you some self-control. Help, help the fruit of the Spirit rise up within me. Help me to be more controlled with my spending. Help me to be more controlled with my mouth. Help me to be more controlled with my eating. Help me to be more controlled with, with this anger that seems to take over. Help me to be con more controlled. I don't want jealousy to roll to, to rule and roll over me. I want to have that under control. So I need you to help me, Holy Spirit. Whatever it is that you're feeling, whatever works of the flesh you're fighting, the fruit of the Spirit will overcome it. And the Spirit of God, that's so good. The Spirit of God will pluck from the tree of life whatever fruit of the Spirit you need to overcome the works of the flesh. Hallelujah. That's good. So next week, we'll look more deeply into what being led by the Spirit really looks like. We know that that's the key to overcoming the flesh, being led by the Spirit. We learn more about what the flesh is and how the flesh operates today. Next week, we're going to learn more about what being led by the spirit actually looks like. Amen. Well, that's all I've got for you today. I pray that you were blessed by what you heard. Remember this, you are empowered by faith. You are equipped for service and your success is in God's word. I love you all. Be blessed and have a blessed week in Jesus name. Amen.